In That's My Wife, Oliver Hardy's helpmate prepares to leave his bed and board for the most insignificant of reasons. How more insignificant can you get than Stan Laurel? Stan came for an overnight visit. He's been planning to depart for months. I'm through, says the wife. But honey, reasons Oliver, if we part, Uncle Bernal will disinherit us. Mrs. Hardy has a word, deleted, for Uncle Bernal. Hello, hello. After an unexpectedly lengthy break, we're finally back together for the latest thrilling episode of the Laurel and Hardy podcast. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm still Patrick Vasey and still your host as we cross-dress our way through episode 29. On today's show, we take a deep dive into Stan and Babe's penultimate short, filmed in 1928, the hilarious That's My Wife. Joining me to discuss the film and shake a stolen necklace out of my frock is returning guest and co-host of the silent comedy Watch Parties, all the way from New York City, it's none other than Steve Massa. But before all that, a couple of updates for you. Firstly, uh, I want to apologise for the delay in getting this episode out. I mean, that was due to a, well, to a couple of factors, really. Um, I was trying to create a very special Christmas episode in which I wanted to invite uh, uh, the wonderful Dick Van Dyke to be interviewed on the show. And all was going well. I'd managed to contact Dick and was messaging backwards and forwards with him, and it was all going in the right direction. I was put in touch with his manager, and then a few weeks went by, and then one day I finally twigged this wasn't Dick Van Dyke at all. It was, in fact, a scammer with a fake Dick Van Dyke messenger account uh, trying to get me to pay £1,500 to have Dick on the show. Uh, Oh, and that was a heavily discounted price, apparently, as well, due to the non-profit status of the podcast, which was very nice of the scammer. So, very disappointed, to say the least. Uh, Christmas came and went with no podcast. Um, But onwards and upwards, after Christmas, I settled to create episode 29 and then fell ill with COVID, just as I was about to record with Steve Massa. Um, I totally lost my voice. Uh, I had a cold in my doze um, and I just generally felt horrible. So, uh, yeah, so more delay. And once I got over that, Russell and I had a major job on our hands to get issue number two of our special Laurel and Hardy magazine ready for the printers. This has now been completed and I have to say... What an amazing issue this has become. 36 beautifully designed pages dedicated to the film Men of War. Um, We have a a new uh, high-end printer on board, so we've got more pages on high-quality printing stock um, and content that every Laurel and Hardy fan will be drooling over. Richard W. Ban has contributed our main articles, but where we asked him for 2,000 words... He actually gave us 22,000 words, and and believe me, that is no exaggeration. Wonderful, yes, but not what I ordered. What do you mean? I ordered 600 soldiers at one foot high. What? I thought you said 100 soldiers at six foot high. (laughs) You got the order all wrong. Put it back in the box and get out of here. You're through. So, working with Richard, I extracted two large sections of his essay, which made up for two fascinating articles on the production of the film, with first-hand accounts, as you would expect from Richard, um, and also its location, uh, the fantastic Hollenbeck Park. Um, But not to deprive readers and fans um, of Richard's content, we are going to be publishing the entire essay as a standalone illustrated publication, the first of what we hope will be a series uh, of the Richard W. Ban Essay Collection. Uh, you can read all about this, of course, in the latest magazine, which will be going out to print any time now. Um, don't forget, you can subscribe to the all-new Laurel and Hardy magazine, um, and also purchase all the back issues at laurelandhardymag.com, uh, or click the link in the podcast show notes. So now you can see why this issue has been delayed, uh, but since I've been back in action, I've also recorded a great interview for use in another bonus episode with actor Jeffrey Wiseman. Uh, Jeffrey, you may know, played in Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood, uh, and he also took over the role of George McFly in Back to the Future 2 and 3. But he also has a big connection to the Laurel and Hardy universe. Uh, That's all I'm going to say for for now, but uh, you can obviously find out all about that uh, when that episode drops, which uh, should be in the next few weeks. 
And of course, the other knock-on effect of all of this has been to keep me away from writing the Laurel and Hardy silence book. Um, but it is still very much moving forward, uh, and I'd like to say a huge thanks for recent contributions to the book from Peter Mickelson in Denmark, Trevor Dorman in Ireland, uh, Glenn Mitchell, and today's uh, special guest, Steve Masser, as well. Now, this really is turning out to be a wonderfully collaborative tribute to the Boy Silent era. Um, it's very much a book to accompany this podcast series, uh, with every film covered, including all the existing stills, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Uh, and with every film covered uh, and, and contributions from many of the podcast's special guests, it really is going to be a Laurel and Hardy fan's dream. So, if you haven't already, don't forget to join the free mailing list to stay updated on how to get your copy of the book once they're ready. Um, just visit laurelandhardypodcast.com. And now, I think that's probably more than enough of an update for this time, so we'll move on to today's film and focus after this short musical interlude. <laughs> And today's film in focus is That's My Wife. It was filmed December 11th, 1928 to December 16th, 1928. Released on March 23rd, 1929. It was produced by Hal Roach, directed by Hal Yates, assisted by Lloyd French and photographed by George Stevens. Turning out comedies in quick succession was common practice at the Hal Roach Studios, but never more so than during the last couple of weeks of 1928. The studio was set to close down entirely between December 29th and January 28th to allow for the installation of new sound recording equipment. Quote, The 1929 programme at the Hal Roach Studio in Culver City will start in production January 28th, according to an announcement made yesterday by Warren Doan, General Manager. The studio is to suspend production on the 29th to remain closed to permit the reconstruction of one of the present stages into two sound stages and the installation of the recording equipment for talking pictures. During the period the plant will be closed, Doan said nearly all of the contracts will be suspended, this being provided in the terms of the agreements under which players and directors are engaged. When the studio reopens, he said, we will have installed one of the most complete sound recording devices of any of the smaller studios, which will give us devices for the making of disc and film track records. Then our 1929 production will swing into full force. And that was in the Los Angeles Times, December 14th, 1928. It was a clear enough plan. However, there was a slight complication. Lengthy delays sustained during the filming of Liberty had thrown the Laurel and Hardy production schedule behind. Two more pictures still needed to be shot before the end of the year if they were to meet their obligations, and there were only a couple of weeks left to do it. A pressured race to the finish lay ahead. But despite this increased pressure on the team, the resulting brace of comedies became arguably two of the funniest pictures that Stan and Babe ever made. The first of the comedies produced was That's My Wife. With time being of the essence, there wasn't the luxury of developing an original story idea, as had been the case for their previous outing, Wrong Again. Instead, a familiar tried and tested formula was relied upon to speed up the process. Leo McCary was credited with coming up with the story idea, but there are several similarities with the plot of a 1926 rote short penned by Stan Laurel and the writing team, and starring both Babe Hardy and Vivian Oakland, called Along Came Auntie. This is a reasonably poor comedy overall, but exploring the parallels with That's My Wife is interesting. Vivian Oakland is to inherit a fortune from her aunt, providing she proves that she is still happily married to her husband, played by Babe Hardy. The snag is that Oakland has divorced Hardy and married another man, Glenn Tryon. As the divorce-hating aunt typically arrives to stay, Oakland realises that her new lodger is her ex-husband. The three must put on a show to fool the aunt for Oakland to secure the money. Whilst the aunt's back is turned, Hardy and Tryon are at each other's throats trying to kill each other. At one point, Tryon even dresses up as a woman to impersonate Oakland. Along Came Auntie is undoubtedly more of a classic farce than That's My Wife, but the similarities between the films are undeniable. 
Yet, the trope of a protagonist set to inherit a fortune, providing they meet a particular criterion, wasn't even new in 1926, with Buster Keaton's Seven Chances adopted against the film's plot a year earlier. And even this was based on a 1916 Broadway stage hit. Even though the scenario wasn't entirely original, Stan's fingerprints are all over Along Came Auntie. The most obvious evidence of this is the drag act by Tryon towards the end of the picture. Female impersonation was a considerable element of traditional British pantomime, so this was very familiar ground for Stan with his background in the English music halls. Indeed, Stan's boyhood stage hero, Dan Leno, favoured this same type of act, which undoubtedly made its impression upon the young Master Jefferson. Stan appeared in drag many times throughout his stage and film career, including seven pictures after partnering with Hardy. Female impersonation was also very popular in Hollywood comedies more generally, with several stars building a reputation for it. Names such as Roscoe or Fatty Arbuckle, John Bunny, Wallace Beery and even the Chaplin brothers Charlie and Sidney famously donned frocks from time to time. And it is female impersonation that Stan relies upon for the bulk of the plot and gags in That's My Wife. Early in the first scene, we're informed by the title card that Stan had come to visit the Hardy home for five minutes and ended up staying for two years, much to the disgust of Mrs Hardy, played by Vivian Oakland. Either he goes, or I do, is the ultimatum thrown down by Mrs Hardy, and Ollie's lack of an immediate and suitable response results in his wife smashing a couple of plant pots and slamming the door behind her as she leaves. Following her departure, there's a nice gag where Ollie starts to pace the room, punching the air in frustration, and Stan copies him as if he's also been slighted. It's not long before the boys fall out, and there follows a bit of pushing and shoving which results in Stan storming off upstairs to pack his bags. Ollie realises that without a wife, he'll now no longer benefit from his Uncle Bernal's significant inheritance. Just then, out of the blue, who should knock at the door but Uncle Bernal himself come to meet Ollie's wife for the first time. Now, Uncle Bernal is played brilliantly by William Cordwright, whose only other appearance with Laurel and Hardy is as Colonel Blood's butler in Duck Soup. Before starting his film career, Cordwright toured the world with a minstrel troupe before appearing in his first motion picture in 1912. He appeared in around 68 pictures throughout his film career, including some for the hugely influential D.W. Griffith. Yet his role as Uncle Bernal with Stan and Babe was his crowning glory, and he excels in this prominent role. In fairness, Courtright isn't given that much to do, his only real job is to react to what's happening around him. And one might wonder why the role wasn't assigned to a more regular member of the growing stock company, such as Edgar Kennedy or James Finlayson. But the understated Courtright is perfect in this role. He doesn't play it for laughs, or use larger-than-life characterful actions as Kennedy and Finlayson would undoubtedly have done. He plays it straight, and it works wonderfully. In desperation, Ollie convinces Stan not to walk out on him, but instead he gets him to dress up in his wife's clothes and play the part of his spouse for the supposedly brief meeting with his uncle. Bernal is keen to meet Mrs Hardy, and Ollie attempts to prepare the ground by informing him that, quote, She's not much to look at, but what a clown. When he finally sees the dolled up Stan, Courtright's face speaks volumes as he sees her, and his expression seems to say, My God, what an ugly woman. Uh, Not content to chat over a coffee at home, though, Uncle Bernal insists the threesome go for a little dinner and dancing at the Pink Pop. And it is within these familiar surroundings that the rest of the farce is played out. There are a few reused gags from our previous visit to the nightclub in their purple moment, with Stan falling on top of his date or his partner whilst walking into the club, and a waiter tripping face-first multiple times into a tray full of cake. Now, in an interesting reversal of fortune, Stan and Babe are joined in one scene by a British comic and graduate from the Fred Carno company, Jimmy Aubrey. Jimmy Aubrey was a famous silent film comedian who rose to fame in the 1910s and 1920s. Born in 1886, he began his career as a vaudeville performer before transitioning to the big screen. He appeared in over 200 short comedy films, often playing a mischievous character who caused chaos and got into trouble. Although his comedies aren't overly funny, Aubrey was a big hit with audiences, and he became one of the highest paid comedians of his time. 
From 1919 to 1920, Babe Hardy regularly appeared as a supporting player in his comedies. However, Hardy's natural scene-stealing abilities were not appreciated by the star. Aubrey eventually fired Hardy along with his director, Jess Robbins. Babe went on to better things, working with an even bigger star, Larry Seaman, Seaman, and would soon reunite with Robbins in 1921 on a pilot film for G.M. Anderson entitled The Lucky Dog. Jimmy Aubrey gained a reputation as being mean-spirited and unkind to his supporting actors, and by 1928 he had fallen from public favour. And there is perhaps some poetic justice here in that the star, who was so unkind and ungenerous to his supporting players, would ultimately have to resort to playing small supporting roles, such as this one in Hardy's incredibly successful series. Another slice of humble pie, Mr Aubrey? In That's My Wife, Aubrey plays the role of a drunk positioned at a neighbouring table to the boys. Aubrey is amorously attracted to the disguised Stan and seeks his attention. Now, although he's no Arthur Hausman, Aubrey does play the part well, and his scenes are amusing. Uh, he invites himself over to join Stan and Ollie's table and proceeds to make advances towards Stan, much to the disgust of Uncle Bernal, who insists Ollie do something forceful. Ollie responds by tipping a bowl of soup over the drunk's head. Aubrey orders another bowl of soup to take away and leaves the club. Uh, it's relatively standard and typically funny action to this point, but it switches up a gear from here. A petty criminal, played by stock company regular Harry Bernard, works as a waiter in the nightclub and steals an expensive necklace from a lady diner. The crime is quickly detected, so Bernard immediately ditches the jewellery down the back of Stan's dress. What follows is hilarious and slightly risque comedy gold. Stan senses a foreign object in his dress and implores Ollie to help him remove it discreetly, so they take to the dance floor. Now, whilst the viewers know this is all innocent, the nightclub staff, the fellow dancers, the diners, and not forgetting Uncle Bernal, certainly do not. The boys dance around trying to shake out or reach the offending article, with Babe trying to get his hands down the back of Stan's dress. The fellow patrons can't believe their eyes and Uncle Bernal becomes increasingly disgusted by the blatant acts of what he perceives as disgraceful public displays of affection. A building on the risque nature of the pants-swapping scenes in Liberty, these sequences are hilariously innocent yet ripe with sexual connotations. Yet it is more likely that the main inspiration for this scene goes back to a 1925 Charlie Chase short called His Wooden Wedding. This comedy, directed by That's My Wife story writer Leo McCary, has Charlie Chase attempting to retrieve a piece of jewellery from inside Gail Henry's dress without her knowing, and uses a dance floor as the ideal place to shake it loose. Whilst this is an equally funny sequence, Stan and Babe develop the gag much further. They are discovered in compromising positions in phone booths behind privacy screens and ultimately are revealed on all fours as the stage curtains draw back to present the evening's floor show Garrick and Lucille in the pageant of love. This is the last straw for Uncle Bernal, whose exasperation and revulsion at all he's seen have been a joy to witness. With one last slip, Stan falls on top of Ollie, causing his wig to come off, and the game is up. Uncle Bernal denounces his nephew and leaves, promising to gift his fortune to an animal hospital. The final scene sees Ollie pitifully stating that he's lost his wife and his fortune, and he declares, what could be worse? At that moment, Jimmy Aubrey's hand appears from off screen and tips a bowl of soup over Ollie's head. Uh, there's a lovely moment here, right at the death, as the screen starts to fade to black, where Stan looks at Ollie and gives him that wonderful wide smile of his, and Ollie's depressed countenance cracks, and he can't help but smile back as the soup runs down his face. It's a lovely moment that perfectly fits the Stan and Ollie relationship. In recent years, That's My Wife has enjoyed a very positive reputation as one of the boys' best silent comedies. Notable commentator William K. Everson suggested that it was, quote, perhaps the funniest and best of Stan's drag films. And years later, historian Randy Scretvet commented that it was, quote, one of the very best of the team's early pictures. Strangely, though, the film's reception by vocal exhibitors upon release was not as celebratory as the team were used to. Quote, fair, but not as good as some of the others these two have made. 
from the Regent Theatre, Chaplow, Ontario, Canada. Not as good as the others, but we'll please them and make them laugh. From the Palace Theatre, Rector, Arkansas. Plenty of laughs, but not quite as many as in most of their previous ones. From the Majestic Theatre, Washington, Kansas. And a very interesting comedy from Silver Family Theatre in Greenville, Michigan. It's a possibility, of course, that people's taste in comedy has changed over the years, and whilst a modern audience may appreciate risque humour, perhaps in 1929 it was a different story. However, the following review may provide evidence as to why That's My Wife failed to achieve the same plaudits as most of the boys' previous outings. Quote, This evidently was another knockout before the censors got in their work. From the Central Theatre in Selkirk, Manitoba. And this single comment may hold the key to the lukewarm reception afforded to what today we revere as a great and hilarious comedy. That's My Wife was produced and released in what's now referred to as the Pre-Code Era. The Motion Picture Production Code, also known as the Hayes Code, was first introduced in March 1930. It was the first attempt to introduce standardised film censorship in the US, providing guidelines for film producers to work towards. Before the code's inception, Hollywood's reputation had been dragged through the mire with the infamous Roscoe Arbuckle court case and several other front-page scandals concerning notable figures from the movie industry. Local pressure groups were adamant that the movie studios and their films were toxic to morality in America. In the absence of a nationally standardised censorship system, each state took it upon itself to provide its own censor boards. They all had their unique criteria dependent upon each locality's sensibilities. For instance, quote, Women could not smoke on screen in Kansas, but could in Ohio. A pregnant woman could not appear on screen in Pennsylvania, but could in New York. All six censorship states, which controlled over 30% of the theatre seats in America, condemned illegitimacy and sexual deviance. After producers cut their film, censors recut them. The outcome was mutilated prints and adverse publicity. End quote. Now, given this uncontrolled and random butchery to their products, it's understandable that the movie studios initially welcomed William Hayes and his groundbreaking code with open arms. A nationally recognised code, accepted and trusted by the majority of local censors, was their only way of maintaining control of their pictures. If a movie conformed to the code, then there was no need for local censors to pick up the scissors. It's highly likely, therefore, given the suggestively risque nature of many of the best sequences in That's My Wife, that audience were left with very disjointed, heavily cut prints of the film that had their best comedic moments chopped out and discarded. So considering all that, the lukewarm reviews begin to make some sense. Although Stan and Babe's films were generally not rich in material that one might expect to offend the censor's sensibilities, this was certainly not the first time that one of the team's films had been subject to local editing. As discussed previously, the New York censor took offence to the tyre puncturing scene in Two Tars, and would only allow the film to be screened there on the understanding that the scene would be removed. It's a wonder then that the boys' next film would have been released in the Big Apple at all. <laughs> To help me to discuss today's film in focus is silent film historian and author, and along with another friend of the podcast, Ben Modell, is a co-host of the award-winning silent comedy watch party on YouTube. He is returning guest, the brilliant Steve Massa. Welcome back to the Laurel and Hardy podcast, Steve. Oh, thanks, Patrick. It's great to be back. It is always a pleasure to have you back, Steve. Always a pleasure. Um, and a third time, I think it is now yes. for you on the podcast. Yes, yes. Third, third time. time. Um, and firstly, before we go anywhere, congratulations, many congratulations to you and Ben on your award that you've won recently for the uh, the silent comedy watch parties. Tell us about that, Steve. Oh, that was on um, Pamela Hutchinson's Silent London blog. We were chosen in second year in a row, actually, the best, uh, I guess, uh, streaming silent film series online. So, that yeah, it was very nice. It's she does the poll every year where she polls her readers. Uh, silent London, which is a wonderful blog, which is, you know, she writes about all things silent film. And uh, so, yeah, it was a real thrill. 
That's brilliant. It's great to get some recognition for all the hard work, isn't it? It's uh, <laughs> very, very well deserved. Fantastic. And also, of course, I have to mention, a couple of weeks ago, we enjoyed Stan and Ollie's debut on The Watch Party with Putting Pants on Philip. That's right. That's right. Fine. How did that now, go? It, the numbers jumped up right away. Uh, <laughs> I think people were waiting for Laurel and Hardy. We yeah. we hadn't shown any uh, because of the rights issues, but now the 1927s are in public domain. Yeah. So we decided, you know, we wanted to go ahead and start showing them. So and putting pants on Philip is one of my favorites of the early, the, the early shorts. So uh, yeah, it's a cracker. It's great. Yeah, it was great to show and, and audiences loved it. And lot, cool. surprisingly enough, a, a number of people said they'd never seen it. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly, I suppose, the whole point of the watch party, isn't it? To introduce new films to people, but you kind of don't expect it to be a Laurel and Hardy film. I suppose, yeah, but... I mean, I thought, oh, people must have. But I guess, you know, their silent films are still not as accessible, although they're all over YouTube for the most part. But, you yeah. know, as far as DVD releases and uh, the, the many of the silents, their team, teaming films aren't as accessible as the sound films. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And and that, that, you know, that is a huge kind of mission of mine, if you like, is to try and ring the bell for these silent films, because mm. there is some absolute classics in there, some real treasures. Oh, and yeah. I think it's a crime when, especially Laurel and Hardy fans, just kind of ignore them. They, they yeah. won't have anything to do with them. I think it's, oh, it, re it really does uh, upset me greatly. So, yeah, we, <laughs> uh, it's great. It's great to see them on the watch party. And I'm, I'm really pleased that. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to be showing more. Brilliant. We'll be showing Brilliant. more. Well, keep us informed. Keep us informed. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Okay, so today, Steve, we are talking about um, an absolute classic uh, yes. of the of the silent shorts. Now, I know the last time we met, uh, I, I left you on a deserted atoll just off the <laughs> coast of New York yeah. somewhere, I think it was. That's right. In the Hudson. Um, and I left you with three films, and your silent short of choice was That's My Wife. So, yes. therefore, I thought, who better to get on the show uh, to discuss this but somebody who loves it as I do? Um, it probably will be quite a one-sided discussion because we both love it. Yeah, um, it's, but, uh, it's uh, one of my favourites. It is brilliant. It is a real, real good one. Um, and what, what really, um, I should say surprises me, but what I think is really interesting is that it was one of the last two films to be made in 1928. Mm. Um, but interestingly, they only had two weeks to make the last two films. Yeah, that's so, right. They had to, yeah, speed along. And, and and those two films were That's My Wife and um, Big Business. Yes, <laughs> which is, you know, two of, I think, two of their best silent. So if, if, if anybody gets uh, um, inspired by a little bit of pressure, <laughs> obviously the Roach Studios can, uh, yeah. Got, got their weekend. juices, got their juices flowing, you know. Absolutely right. But I guess also it goes to show you that you don't need to overthink Laurel and Hardy comedies to make good Laurel and Hardy comedies. They can do magic with just, you know, hardly yeah. anything at all. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, what I'd like to start with, and we did this last time because I'd mm. I like to try and pick your brains and make the make the, the, the most of your knowledge on the sort of silent comedy universe. Can you give us a bit of context, Steve, to what was happening at the end of 1928, just well, generally in, in comedy? Really, what's happening at the end of 1928 not just in comedy films, but in films in general, it's a transition to sound. I mean, sound is looming. Yeah. Uh, and some studios are already making sound films. So if you've got, you know, say, uh, That's My Wife was released in early 1929. So you've got, like, if you want to pick a couple of films, you have Spite Marriage, you have Buster Keaton's 1929 feature, which is all silent, has a musical score, has a musical track. And also you have Welcome Danger from 1929, which is Harold Lloyd's first talkie. You know, you've got this people, they're moving to sound and they're trying to work out. And, you know, Welcome Danger, of course, is a good example of that because Lloyd's last two silent films, The Kid Brother and Speedy, are two of his best films. They're fantastic. You know, they're both masterpieces and he's just so effortless. I mean, he's a, such a master of what he's doing. But then with Welcome Danger, I wouldn't say he went, had to go back to square one, but it, it you know, it, I have you, did, Patrick, have you seen Welcome Danger, the sound? Yes, yeah. You know, his character is so annoying. 
<laughs> he's just he's kind of a know-it-all and he's talking all the time and he's just and they do a lot of kind of bad vaudeville gags you know because he pulls he's on the train at the opening he pulls into a station and it's newberry or something and he said well i've heard of raspberries or blueberries but this is a new berry on me i mean he's doing gags like that you know verbal gags that i guess they thought they had to do because it was a sound film and uh so and and the whole climb where he's on the scaffolding that's being pulled up the side of the building sound changed at all because you can hear traffic noises you can hear him crying for help it just it it makes it you know there was always the thrill factor that was part of like the climb and safety last and some of the other climbs but the comedy element outweighed the the thrill or the danger but in in well in um oh you know i jumped a feet first didn't i the climb in feet first yes but again it's it's how sound changed what lloyd was doing because of the the traffic noise and him crying for help it just it changed the playing field. So it took them a few films like Harold. It took him welcome danger and feet first to get back to movie crazy where he's sort of getting back in his groove. Yeah. And yeah. of course in night in spite marriage, Keaton's still doing, you know, it's silent, but it's under the auspices of MGM. So he has this different supervision and the films kind of scaled down, you know, so many, Keaton films are epics like Steamboat Bill Jr. There's epic gags with the house side of the house falling on him. So with MGM, it's been it's been scaled down. There's too much supervision, but he still has sequences like uh, trying to put his drunken wife to bed and things like that, which are you know one of the great Keaton sequences. Shorts too, people were adapting to sound. Max Sennett started making. I think his first talk, he was in 1927, something called The Lion's Roar, where the lions loose in the studio, but this time you could hear them roar. So they were all sort of adapting. And in a lot of cases, the pace slowed down terribly when they yeah. went to sound. You'll see some of the Max Senate talkies, and it's just kind of dead air. <laughs> they often don't have background scores either. So there isn't that music to kind of fill in like, like Roach would do with all the the Leroy Shields uh, in our gang, you can have plenty of pauses between the kids talking because you've got those great tunes in the back. Absolutely. I mean, the music becomes like a, another character in the film. For, for well, the they, cer shorts. they certainly do in the Roach shorts. Yeah. Roach, you know, Roach's adaptation to sound was pretty easy. Hmm. Um, he had these... He had these performers that had unique voices like Stan and Ollie, Charlie Chase, and all the kids in our gang too. It's so it, you know, it yeah, because the kids had been on a on a tour, I think, around uh, around the states, hadn't they? On like a theatre tour, going on stage and getting some experience. I don't know if that was the the point of the tour. I, I'm not sure exactly if that. Was it could have been. Right. It could have been yeah. because Charlie Chase did a tour. He did a stage tour right before he started talkies as well. So I'm thinking he must have been trying to just. Uh, brush up his his verbal abilities because you know he had spent years in vaudeville so yeah yeah it's, a, it's such a fascinating period isn't it it really is to see how they were how they were positioning themselves how they were going to try and get themselves used to talking and and let's like say with harold lloyd almost going right back to, to to what he knows is going to work but can i tweak it to work make it work with sound and it's, yeah then the sound it's... ad and you'll see a lot of things like there's a well, there's a Lupino Lane short, a uh, talkie short that he did for Jack White. It was an extension of his silent series. It's called Purely Circumstantial. But the the physical sequences are shot at silent speed and mm. the sound sequences are shot at sound speed, 24 frames. So when they get into the physical action, it's kind of sped up. So there was a lot of that going on where you, you it's not it's not seamless. It's like you're going from one world to another. Yes. But yeah. I think they realized that the physical stuff isn't going to work at sound speed. It needs that crispness that silent speed gave it. So it was a hard transition. Yeah, and it's such a, you know, I always think it's such a shame that um, in, in a way that, that sa sound came in when it did because the, the, the techniques they were using for silent films was such a, you know, there was such a level at that point. Oh, I know. They'd reached, they'd really 
reach the apex. I mean, there's some, you know, amazing films like, oh, the von Sternberg Docks of New York and Sunrise and all these, these beautiful, just wonderful films. It really had become just a real wonderful art form. And the companies like Big Business or the Max Davidson shorts or, you know, or the, the what we were talking about, the cameraman, the general, you know, all, all these wonderful. And then sound just changed the whole playing field and stopped, you know, that peak. And it would be a few years before things started kind of rolling where you could effortlessly, effortlessly put sound and film together again. You know, it took a few years. Yeah, fascinating period. It really is. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting onto the uh, the talkies. I must admit, because there is such a lot to to sort of discuss and to you know to, to listen to as well. You know, we can yeah. also use a lot a lot of audio clips and things. So it's it's a great great period. But it's been such a joy to to um, you know revisit the silent films and look at just how just how good actually Stan and Ollie were in the in the, in yeah, the um, shorts. I remember, in fact, the first time you came on, you know, I asked you how you thought. Um, Stan and Babe's silent films compared to, you know, the, the big three or four, if you count Arbuckle as well. Mm. Um, and then they are up there, you know. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, a di- it's a different kind of, it's almost a different era of silent films, isn't it? But it, they, the quality of the films is so, oh, yeah. so and, good. And they're part of the peak, what I refer to as the peak of silent comedy. And, and it's what we were talking about, the very end. I mean, that stuff that was being done at the Roach Lot is the peak and they had like, you know, Leo McCary was one of the people really behind it, but, you know, so they were part of the final peak of silent film, silent comedy. And, And, you know, I think the Max Davidson films and the Charlie Chase films. I mean, they're, they're really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So that's my wife. As I say, it it was the second to last film um, that the boys made in 1928. Um, now, just sort of looking at the, the the story development for that's my wife, it doesn't appear to be an overly original story. No, it's you know it's a good excuse to get Stan in his, in drag again because <laughs> he hadn't done it. I think for was it Duck Soup? Was Duck Soup the uh, or uh, he kind of did it? Why in, girls um, love sailor? He did it in that, but then Duck Sugar Soup Daddies as well. Sugar Daddies. Yes, Sugar Daddies. Well. That's right. Yeah. So probably yeah. it had been since Sugar Daddies. Um, but I mean, I think the plot works really well. I mean, it's very simple. You know, the wife leaves because Stan annoys her and the rich uncle is coming. So, you know, you've got to get Stan and Drag to pose as a wife. So I, that's it. very simple, but I think it works really well. It does, uh, and I think it's um, the, the 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 comparisons are drawn with it to uh, nineteen twenty six. Along came Auntie, yes, uh, which, the Glenn Tryon. Featured, exactly, Glenn Tryon yeah. pops pops in again, and uh, and Babe Hardy is also in that film, as well as Vivian Oakland. So there's yes, a lot of comparisons right. uh, with that. Uh, I also noticed, um, which was a bit of fun in in that film, Vivian Oakland is holding um, the fake dog. That Edgar Kennedy uses in Bacon Grabbers. Yeah, that space. one with the, where the mouth opens. It kind of <laughs> jumps. Right. It's in a. It's in a few things. Oh, is it really? Oh, okay, yeah, I've, I've not seen it, it in a couple of things. I guess it was just a funny prop they had there at the studio. Yeah. Decide yeah. some people liked it, so I guess they wanted to work it in. That's it. That's it. It's, it's nice to because uh, I know a lot of people like to spot props that keep turning up. There's a particular clock, I think, that the boys uh, use mm. quite a lot in, in, in their films, but uh, that dog's a bit more obvious. <laughs> yes. Well, it's nice, too. Like, you know, the nightclub that they often use in the silence, the pink pup. Yes. Uh, I think they go to it in their purple moment. And That's right. Do it in this. And then I think is it, it's even in putting pants on Philip. Some of the scenes are outside on the sidewalk, but you see a sign on the wall that says the pink pup. Now that always turns up too. Yeah, and they also, um, oh, what's it called now? I forget, forget the title. Um, where Stan takes May Bush. Um, it's the oh, which, love them and weep. Lo, yes, love them and weep. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that escaped me. It's been a long week. Well, that. Uh, but yeah. yes, that, I think they also go into the pink pop there as well. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, the Stan does a great pratfall down the stairs as they as they enter, but. Um, well, there's some nice uh, Pratt Falls and That's My Wife, too, where they keep, they, uh, one of them falls and the other falls on top <laughs> kind of thing. 
And they do that quite a bit in this. Can you let go of my ears? So I want to just touch a little bit on um, female impersonation because obviously that is that was a big thing for Stan. Yeah. Um, obviously he he was very familiar with that whole kind of um, trope or you know sort of genre. Well, sure, of, that's uh, you know such a British music hall uh, kind of thing with people like Dan Leno doing it for years. Yes. And, and you know, and Stan did it on stage quite a bit, and he did it with Mae Dahlberg. I know when right. touring the United States, I've seen photos where, oh, Stan would play May's mother or something. And it was a knockabout thing where, you know, Stan was supposed to be an older lady, but May's knocking him over and all this kind of <laughs> stuff. So they, so they did it in their act. And, yeah. and, you know, female impersonation was a regular routine kind of comedy thing. Like all the British music hall people did it, but even in, American films, you know, Fatty Arbuckle was yeah. famous. John Bunny did it quite a bit too. He would always play Irish cooks and, and <laughs> things like that. And he, and he looked totally believable as an Irish cook. Yeah. So in, yeah. As, um, and Wallace Beery, you know, he made his, his name playing at SNA, playing a character called Sweetie, who was supposed to be this big lummox Swedish girl. <laughs> very funny. I've seen a few of them, and he's very good. It's very funny. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, Charlie did a few. Charlie Chaplin did a few where he's in drag, but it was really his brother, Sidney, who did a film. He did Charlie's Aunt. He did the film, the 1925 film version of Charlie's Aunt. But he did another film called Oh, What a Nurse, where he's playing a nurse in drag. You know, he's in drag as a nurse. Sydney was, you know, pretty well known for doing that. And there, a lot of people kind of specialized, people like Ian Eltinge and things like that. So it, it was a popular, um, what do you want to say, device on stage and early films. It was very popular. And some people were, some people looked really good in drag, like Stan is yeah. almost believable, you know, yeah. as an yes. unattractive woman, but, you know. Yeah, well, certainly if you ask Uncle Bernal. Yeah, oh, his, I love his face. <laughs> when he turns to the camera and gives that look when he first sees Stan. He does a few the, of them. What the hell is this? <laughs> when he looks behind the couch and he sees all the mess, again, he yeah. turns to the camera and there's a reaction. When he sees Stan, he turns to the camera. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, it's uh, well. Let's 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 talk about William Courtright. Uh, what can you tell us about him? Well, he he was trying to think how old he was at this point he was born in 1848 so he lived to 30 1933 he was like 85 so at that point he's pushing 80 and uh he was a long time stage performer he was a famous minstrel he had been a minstrel performer and he was known as uncle billy uncle billy cartwright and he had an act that he did with his wife, an actress named Jenny Lee, and they toured it all over. And he was known as the Fluey Fluey Man because he did a number called Fluey Fluey that was very popular. And I have no idea what the number was like. <laughs> I've only seen it in the trade magazines, I'd say. Oh, this is the Fluey Fluey Man of vaudeville fame. He started working in films for D.W. Griffith at the Biograph Studio. So he's in a bunch of things. I mean, you go to IMDb, you'll see some, but we have the Lillian Gish papers uh, where I work at the New York Public Library for the performing arts. And we have a lot of photos from Biograph Films and there he is, you know, in doing character roles and stuff. So he's in more than on IMDb. So he, he worked for Griffith. And then when Griffith moved to the Reliance studio, he went along, he's in Intolerance somewhere. And, uh, but not long after that, he started appearing in features as a character guy. And he's in features with Will Rogers and uh, Douglas Fairbanks and Monty Banks, you know, playing character roles. And he, he turns up in a lot of shorts, too. So I think he first hit Roach around 1926. He's okay, so the Duck Soup kind of. Yeah, because he's the butler. Duck Soup, but he he's also in Charlie, My Boy, with Charlie Chase. He's in... Um, couple of the Mabel Norman Hal Roach shorts. So he was he was doing a bunch of Roach 
uh, things. But this is the best role he had at, at Roach. I mean, it's, it's a great featured role. And, he, and it's his next to last film. He only did one more film, which was Our Gang's Teacher's Pet, early sound film. And the opening of the film, Miss Crabtree, uh, June Marlowe, stops at a store and orders ice cream and cake that they're going to have for the kids because she's the new teacher. And Uncle Billy has taken the order. He's the shopkeeper. She leaves and he has a big reaction. He says, boy, I wish I'd go back to school. You know, <laughs> so pretty, but he does this huge take. It's hilarious. And that's his last, uh, his last film. So. Right. Right. Well, I mean, he, like you say, he, he is just so good in that smile. Do, I, I really think he makes that film. I mean, I know Stan and Babe are just flawless. He does it. because of the, the comic tension too. He's yeah. he, his, his timing and everything. He's hilarious, but he has a certain gravity that you know, yeah. that you need that comic tension to make it yes. work, and it really works. Yeah, I was because I was I was Good. sort of thinking to myself, you know, you know, William Courtright is he's not in any any other. Oh well, okay, he's in he's in Duck Soup, but it's a very small role. There's, there's yeah. nothing very prominent. He's not in any of the other films very prominently. So I'm wondering why did they decide to choose him for this particular role? It's a very very it's a big role. You know, it's a it's a very important role. Yeah. Why not Why not use I don't know, Eddie Kennedy or Jimmy Finlayson, but I don't think it would have worked. The no, same. no, they're he too comic, so good. you know, they're, they're almost, you know, if you use somebody by Finlayson, he would have been doing double takes and yeah. Yeah. And Cartwright plays it fairly seriously. I mean, he yeah. plays it, you know, like he's got that gravity, he plays it seriously. Yeah. So he does a couple of looks to camera, but they're believable. Yes. You know, yeah. you would do that too. If you saw Stan and drag, you'd turn and say, wow, you know, yeah. Yeah, because I think that's it. He he doesn't have, he doesn't have a lot to do, but what he does is just so well done. Those yeah. sort of when, when he's kind of watching them dancing on the dance floor and he's sort of shaking his head <laughs> as if this is disgraceful. <laughs> no, he everything he does is very good. Like every moment counts. Every second that they, yeah. they cut to him or whatever, you know, yes, is it yeah. pays off right away. Definitely, definitely. Great. He's really good. He's definitely the unsung hero of that film. I have to. He's, he yeah. should have been on the on the posters because he was he was so it's, good. That's why, really, I think, like you said, why it really works so well. Hmm. I think so. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um. So uh, yeah. So Will, So William Courtright, Vivian Oakland. Yes. Unfortunately, she's barely in it, but yeah. it's got a nice little bit. I love the bit where she goes out the door and she knocks the plant over. She <laughs> the front door, and then she comes in a second later and knocks the other one over. Yeah. Just yes, yeah. I hadn't done enough that first time. I'm going back in. Yeah, again. but she's good, you know. I, it's, it's very short and sweet. But she'd been doing a lot of stuff at Roach by that. Yes, I think she she hit there around 26, and she's in some of the Glenn Tryon comedy. She kind of plays the kind of sexy other woman a lot at that point with her blonde hair. Now she came from vaudeville. And her vaudeville partner and husband was a guy named John T. Murray. And he's in some roach things. And later he's in a lot of the Charlie Chase Columbia shorts in the 40s, the sound show. And he, he was a well-known comic. Uh, and they were a vaudeville team. And it's funny because you see pictures of them in the early 20s in vaudeville. Her hair is black. I mean, she, she's dark haired, very attractive, but she's a brunette some reason when they when she went into films they made her a blonde you know and, and real blonde you know kind of dyed blonde thing and she's you know she's kind of the sexy other woman although she is sometimes i think in um what's it we fall down i think yeah we fall down she's yeah. one of the wives so she's yeah she she could be really good at being menacing She's she's very like stern. She yeah. frightens me. I've got to say, <laughs> I think you would mess. The most famous thing with Stan and Ollie is Scram, the talking where she's the judge's wife and they get drunk and. How's about a little dance? Well, we'd rather not. Your husband might not like it. I want to dance. I want to dance. <laughs> yeah, she's great in that. I mean, she's she's really funny. But then, she. She got kind of matronly because by the time of Way Out West, she's the passenger in the stagecoach. Yes. They're putting her arms around her and Ollie's saying, oh, lots of weather we're having lately. <laughs> Things like that. You know, they're <laughs> annoying her till 
the husband where she gets off and her husband's the sheriff. Darling! Not you, I meant my husband. Have a nice trip, darling. Lovely. Until these two came aboard. And they've done nothing but annoy me all the way in. Here, you run along home. Goodbye. But then in the 1940s, she was busy. Um, she would play Leon Errol's wife in shorts, or she play Edgar, she played Edgar Kennedy's wife in some of those shorts. So she into the 50s, she was playing everybody's wife in these shorts. So she, you know, she had a fairly long career. Yeah, yeah. They say very, very effective in the in the stone wife uh, category. Um I don't I don't think they I don't think they have a sterner wife. I don't. I, I'm, I, Gertrude has to give them a good run for her money. She's Anita Garvin tough. could be tough too. Yeah, that's true. Some of those looks Anita gives them in blotto. Now listen to me. It would have to be something mighty important to get you out of this house tonight. Now sit down. Stop annoying me. That's true. Yes, that's Intense. true. Intense, but <laughs> but sh Bibby and Oakland's pretty tough. It's hard. Yeah. To <laughs> they know how to pick them. Yeah, um, and we have uh, we have Charlie Hall. Oh yeah, he, he yeah. you see him a few times popping in and out, and Sam Lufkin is the way yeah. that keeps falling in the cake or whatever. It is. <laughs> I think he does it three or four times in this one, where he keeps. Oh, it's got to be three. It's got to be the rule of three. Yes, surely. right, of course. It's like the Stan sock keeps getting dragged off. Yeah, that's <laughs> three times. Yeah, that's three times as well. That's Perfect. a great bit too. Very fun. <laughs> And then Harry Bernard is the stealing waiter. He steals the neck. That's right. That's right. Drops it down the back of Stan's dress and starts the whole. Um, that's one of my favorite, you know, the whole thing of them trying to get the necklace out. And uh, especially it, it Bill, you know, first they're, they keep getting caught. Then they're in the telephone booth and they come out. <laughs> and then the whole thing where they introduce uh, Garrick and Lucille in the pageant of love. And the yeah. parts and it's Stan and Ollie on, on their knees doing the thing. <laughs> And he pulls his petticoat out. Goes, <laughs> yeah. So that builds really well. That's That that really leads up to that. It's so, And the film is so well constructed. You know, it's just everything is just... The setups and everything is just perfect. You know, it's like it does. It it builds really, really well. And uh, and the one the one thing that uh, I mean, the, the the whole sort of dance floor sequence where the where Ollie's trying to shake that necklace, which at this point has already fallen out. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> it's just just oh, it has me on the floor every single time. I think it's one of the it's one of the biggest belly laughs from from all of the silent films for me. And to be honest, for, for, throughout the whole of the the Laurel and Hardy canon. That, yeah. That sequence is just And it's fantastic. great. And, you know, it's a little bit, there's a sequence in the Charlie Chase short, um, his wooden, wooden wedding, where Gail Henry has some jewelry, oh, the diamond, the diamond uh, ring that has been put down her back, and Charlie takes her out on the dance floor and tries to get her to jump up and down and all this stuff. And he, right. that's it. So it's like Stan and Babe took that, First. So that came before that's why. Yeah, that, that was, was an early oh, twenty five. Right, okay. That was right. twenty five. So it's like they took that gag and put a new spin on it and integrate. That's interesting. For this, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll have to look that one up because that is such a good. Oh, it's a great it's short a good, too. Great sequence, as you say, and, it, and they, you'll see them in in uh, behind tables and behind screens, and they just uh, getting rumbled. Very much like Liberty with the with the trouser swapping gag. It's the same yes. kind of thing, isn't it? Where they're yes. getting caught short. And of course. Ollie knows all the implications. You know, he's the one looking really sheepish and really embarrassed. <laughs> Stan, not That's so right. much, you know. That's right, yes. Ollie's face is just such a picture. There's there's one particular moment where um, they're on the dance floor and they're having a bit too much of a... Oh, and, and the, the the waiter or the, the, the head waiter comes up and says to quit the wrestling or something. Yes, yes. And Ollie's face as they, they start the dancing again. Oh, it's just amazing. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Oh, and no. what makes that as well is the, the music. Um, ah, the, yes. I'm going to Charleston back to Charleston. Kicks in. <laughs>
and it just fits that sequence so well. It's well, yeah, and a... of course, you know, this is one of the films with the original scores, you know, that we're... Yes, nice, yeah, if, you know. it was the last, let me get this right, it was the last Laurel and Hardy film with a full orchestral score. Mm. Um, and you know, I've I've spoken in the in on past episodes with uh, with Randy and uh, and Glenn Mitchell about the music used and how it fits so perfectly with the, yeah. the action on on screen. So um, the film opens with "Is She My Girlfriend," uh, which we've heard in in quite a number of films, and it's it's almost it's one of those tunes which kind of becomes a almost a theme tune you know they uh-huh. use it very very often uh, in a lot of these songs especially if there's kind of a we fall down element where there's there's girls involved <laughs> What'll I do by Irving Berlin also ah, creeps creeps up a couple of times through really famous film. one actually uh, and then we have things like ain't she sweet flirts <laughs> and, then, and then as they get onto the dance floor shake that thing <laughs> it's just perfect. And I just, I just wish that you know, as Randy's always said, you know, back then people knew these tunes, yeah. so that was a joke they would just get in an instant. You know, it would add to the comedy, which was. I just wish my my knowledge of of those titles is was such that you could get that extra element to these. Yeah, films. they just there's they a, worked them in so well. There's a tune I like that they use in these the ones that the, where they did the tracks, and it's a song called Meow. And the Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers cartoons would use it later. Oh, did they? You didn't notice? Yeah, they used it later, like the 30s and 40s. But uh, that's one I always like when I hear it. It, That's a great one. There are some classic, classic tunes. (laughs) Oh, you know, we didn't talk about Jimmy Aubrey. Yes, we should. Oh, we can't miss when we were talking about the cast. Now, the only thing I know about Jimmy, every time I see Jimmy Aubrey mentioned, I always think, oh, <laughs> arsehole. He was an arsehole. Well, he was, <laughs> yeah. It was Jordan Young and Sam Gill interviewed him, I think, out of the motion picture country home. He was in his 90s. Right. And uh, I don't know, this was like the 70s. And <laughs> I have talked to both about it. And yeah. never published. they never published the interview because everything was an expletive. You know, they'd ask him about Oliver. Wow. He'd say, that son of a... And then he'd go, <laughs> don't me money, you know, or all this kind of... He's crazy. I mean, I, Brilliant. again, he's in his 90s, so... Yes, yeah. Oh, we should, uh, we should just put it into context for, for anybody who doesn't know which one Jimmy Aubrey is. Jimmy Aubrey plays the drunk. He's the drunk. takes a fancy to stand, <laughs> so and he's got to be pretty drunk. And he's, <laughs> he's flipping the uh, sugar cubes at him. That's right, that's right. And Jimmy Aubrey was a popular comedian. He was actually a star, a starring yeah. comedian in shorts in the late teens and the 1920s. And of course, Babe Hardy was his supporting comic. 
in the late teens and early 20s and the series that Aubrey did at Vitagraph. But Aubrey had been a, a, a Fred Carno comedian. And he toured the United States with Chaplin and Stan Laurel in the night, you know, Mumming Birds, a night in the English Music Hall. And he played this character, the Terrible Turk. Who, I don't know if he ate fire or something, but uh, it's part of the, the onstage acts that they would be making fun of in the sketch. So he toured with, so, you know, he worked with Chaplin and Laurel. And uh, like many of the Carno people, he decided to stay in the United States. So he left the tour and did his own tours all over. But he started working in New York around 1915. He did a series called Heine and Louie. And Heine and Louie were what were referred to as Dutch comics. It was like, they were like a Weber and Fields clone. I know, you know, because Weber and Fields were really big in vaudeville and they'd done a few films for Max Sennett. Right. So this, this company, the Mitten Falls, studio up in Yonkers, New York, decided to do a Heine and Louie series. So they did a couple of years of, of this. And uh, I think Aubrey was Heine, I think. I'm not sure which was Heine and which was Louie at this point. Right. And then after that, after that series ended, he was in New York. So he started working for Vitagraph in New York and he was supporting uh, Huey Mack at Vitagraph and films that were directed by Larry Seaman. Mm -hmm. Well, Huey Mack ended up going to LKO, so they start offering some of these directed by Larry Seaman. And they're actually pretty good. Seaman was a good director. Uh, but then Seaman got his own series starring, and, and so um, Aubrey continued at Vitagraph. And that's when Babe Hardy became, because they moved him out to the West Coast for Vitagraph. And that's when Babe became his main uh, support for a number of years. Right. And... The thing is, a starring comic, Aubrey's really not very funny uh, when you see those films. And Babe just easily steals the films from him. I mean, you know, and I think he did resent that. I think because yeah. he ended up having Babe fired. He got Babe fired yeah. and the director, Jess Robbins, who was directing most of them. And it's that's Jess right. Robbins who brought Hardy into Lucky Dog. Yes, that's right. Yeah, As because yeah. they were working for Aubrey. And, you know, uh, Robbins was hired to do that test film, the Bronco Billy test film with Stan, and they needed a heavy, so he brought Babel on. So, so you could say, you know, maybe Aubrey was somewhat responsible for Laurel and Hardy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's but, certainly the first film, absolutely. But it had to be a little weird for Aubrey doing this part because... He worked for Vitagraph, and then he moved, he did a series that was produced by Joe Rock, who also produced Stan at the same time. Yeah. But then Aubrey's fortune started dipping a little bit, and he started doing like low-budget shorts for Weiss Brothers, Weiss Brothers art class pictures, and doing bits and westerns and features. So, you know, at this point, he's just kind of a supporting thing to two people. You know, he worked with Stan and Carmen. Oh, and Hardy was his supporting comic. So now he's supporting his supporting comic. But he's very good. He's he's very good in this. I think, yeah, I think he's, he's, he is very good in this. And then when I realized who it was, I, I resented liking it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see his Carno training. Oh, he's really clean. He's really clean and precise. I mean, that's sort of the hallmark of all the Carno people is he rehearsed them so much they would rehearse and rehearse and they're always just so super tight and clean and they know exactly what they're doing yeah yeah i love those um those sort of subtle winks across the stem yeah. <laughs> and they sort of come come and sit over here with me <laughs> and I, I i really love that they they save him for the closing gag yeah yeah don't expect it at all because he leaves he orders that soup to go yeah but then when they give it to him he just goes off so you really don't expect it that's going to end up on Ollie's head at the very end of the film. That's right. That's right. And, that, and in that moment as well, there's that little little smile from Babe Hardy. Have you noticed that? And I don't know whether that's him just breaking out of character because he's you know he's got this soup running down his head. But if you, there's a beautiful the little, little moment where he smiles <laughs> and glances across to Stan, who's who's kind of mugging away at him. Anyway, oh yeah, he's so. doing the pointing yeah, at him. Yeah. 
And I think you, you, your attention draws to Stan because he's got that great smile on his face. But if you just watch Babe... So you don't fantastic. see Babe smile quite so much. Yeah, you, you don't notice it. But when you spot it, you can't stop spotting it after that. It's great. It's a really great little bit. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's... Um, there's just so, <laughs> there's just so much to, to sort of pull out of that film. It's such a very simple um, premise. Yeah. Um, and it's obviously a premise that isn't... It's not brand new. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, Buster Keaton's Seven Chances was a very similar. He's got to have something or do something by a certain time right. to be able to inherit, the, you know, whatever. So that kind of, and I think Seven Chances was also based on a, a, a Broadway. Yeah, it was a play. Yeah, it was a play actually. Sixteen or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So obviously, the whole thing is just, a, you know, they've got they've got a week to 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 film the whole thing, get it done, get it written. So they've they've just grabbed bits from everywhere. Yeah, but it I really think it's just. Yeah, it really all came together beautifully. Yeah. I mean, there's a theme, I don't know, there's a, a comedian, comedian who was at Universal named Wanda Wiley. Mm. We've shown a few of her things on the watch party. Most of her stuff's lost. But almost all of her films is she has to get married by five o'clock or she's got to do something by a certain time. And the whole right. film is just this whole thing of her trying to get there or get done what she needs to get done. So that was always a popular kind of plot or theme because it, it kept the comedians in motion it kept things yeah. moving along because you had no time to spare they had to get you know time yeah. of the essence so yeah yeah no it's brilliant and there's the you know there's things like the um the the dumbbells that ollie puts uh, down uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's yeah, the dumbbells. And the, That's great. And they, of course, fall out, and Ollie trips over them. <laughs> right, the and Stan too. Stan's leaning on the table, and he he steps on, and the, his chin hits the table after That's he sat it. down. Is the it's really good, really, really good. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna have to go watch it again after this because it is just <laughs> such a great, just such a great short. And I'm gonna have to implore any any listeners who haven't watched it, you must must seek this out because this, I think. I think that's my wife is is a very, it's a unique film in a, in a way to, to to the Laurel and Hardy canon. It's very, yeah. um, it's quite risque in a way. Um, oh, it is very much it like, definitely like the yeah. scenes in Liberty. The the pants, you know, the, there's not a lot of stuff in Laurel and Hardy. There's there's little bits. Now well, and, again and this that you this has out. you know a little risque sexual element. Yeah, a little bit like in Duck Soup where Stan is in drag and he's supposed to help uh, Madeline Sh Madeline Herlock take a shower thing too that gets a little okay but you know the first time i saw this film was in um the robert youngson compilation i think it was the perils of laurel and hardy had a big chunk of it yeah. and uh, it's funny because well, i grew up in a small town in ohio and i noticed it was like 1969 i don't know i was 13 or 14 that the local cinema was showing the further perils of laurel and hardy so i really wanted to go but it was on a double bill with the prime of miss jean brody this film with uh, maggie smith you know and and it, it was 20 they were both fox pictures so i guess out in the sticks they would just dump these things to right and so i you know i wanted to go but my mother wouldn't let me go because of the prime of miss jean brody which you know or adult film but i I told her, I don't want to see that. I just want to see the Laurel, and, <laughs> the Laurel and Hardy, but I couldn't see it. But then eventually, about a year later, it ended up on television. Right. For the yeah. Pearl, so I, I got to see it. And then, you know, I really loved the chunk that he used. And then finally, I don't know if it was through Blackhawk films or wherever, but I, you know, got to see the full version. Brilliant. Finally. And <laughs> that is, it's just great. It is. It is. It is a classic. And interestingly, I think the um, the reviews when the film came out were actually quite quite cool, really, towards it. it hmm. I think from what I can remember, all the sort of the local, you know, what the what the what the picture did for me sex, the sections in you know the um, Exhibitors Herald and all that, um, they were kind of the general consensus was it's good. But it's not as good as the normal kind of stuff. Hmm. Uh, and there was a number of people that kind of mentioned um, it would have been good if the censors hadn't got to it first. Oh. So I wonder if it was chopped up quite a bit by some of the local censors. Oh, probably. Um, you know, because some of that stuff, when they're on their knees and he's got his hand down the direction, <laughs> yeah, they, right. I bet they did, you know, because yeah. some of the states like Ohio and 
and yeah. you know massachusetts were pretty puritanical so yeah. they probably did cut large chunks so they probably yeah. reduced the humor element you know yeah. because of that yeah I remember uh, uh, two towers. I think it was um, New York, uh, Censor in New York, had the the scene cut where is it Sam Lufkin stabs the tire and bursts the tire. They just they just cut that out as well. Too violent, or I don't get it. I think it, yeah, I think it said something like it's it. it um, I forget the actual wording now, but it it has it had a tendency to promote yeah. Uh, well, they, violence or destructive they, behavior or something. Yeah, they were very big on violence with silent films because. A lot of prints survive that are obviously censored. Like, see, you know, somebody standing there and somebody sneaks up with a mallet and they're going to hit him in the head. So you see the wind up, but you don't see the impact. The impact is gone. But then you'll see the other person like staggering around after they've been hit, but the impact's been taken out. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes the films only survive that way after they've been laundered by you know, whatever censor. And they had to do that with every state in the United States. Every state had its, you know, own censor board. So you imagine these prints or, you know. Yeah, and I think obviously when, when the Hayes Code came in, obviously that had its issues. But yeah. I think it the reason that Hayes was welcomed so warmly to Hollywood was because they thought they were going to get rid of all of that, or the individual little states taking out yeah. here and there. It would standardize it and make it more... Yeah. Um, they could almost hide behind him as a, as a barrier. Yeah, because if he said something was fine, they could stand behind him. But, you know, they first brought Hayes in for public relations during the Arbuckle scandal. That's how he got into Hollywood. That's right. Because yes, he had been right. Postmaster General as part of the Harding administration. You know, he was a well-known public figure, and they were afraid that Hollywood was going to get shut down because it's not only the Arbuckle scandal, but Wallace Reed died as a morphine addict, and director William Desmond Taylor was shot. So there, that's right. Yes, big yes. scandals, and they all happened to Paramount Pictures. They were working for Paramount, and there were people in the industry that was afraid that the government had step in and shut down Hollywood or really over so again they brought hazen so they could stand behind him and he could be the figurehead and he's going to clean up hollywood and he banned arbuckle and uh, but it wasn't until the 30s that they really put in the code and i can may west had a lot to do with that i think <laughs> the outcry over her you know then they really put it in and then it was taken over by a guy named joseph breen who took over the Hayes Code at that point. But. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll probably come on to that a little bit later on down the road. Uh, yes, as we get right. To, as in we the get talkies. Into, uh, some of the talkies, yeah. Still, yeah. still a lot more to come. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been it's been an absolute blast as always. Thank you so much Thank for you. spending time with us. Thanks for the invite. And, and it's great. Your knowledge of of that whole silent era it never fails to to never ceases to um, you know make me wonder because it's just brilliant. The the depth of knowledge you uh, have in there is my, wonderful. My obsession. So. <laughs> <laughs> I try well, to put it to from it. try to put it to constructive use. Oh, it's great. It's absolutely great. And uh, congratulations again on your award. And hopefully there's uh, there's more down the road. Um, oh, thanks. Do, <clears throat> who, when, when's the next watch party uh, coming up? Is it? Um... Oh, it's this. It's in February. So it's coming up this month. <laughs> and then for the month, yeah. I can't remember the actual date. We have one of our live shows on February 11th. And we're yeah. playing Harry Langdon in Tramp, Tramp, Tramp. Oh, that's great. I love that one. Yeah, we're showing the feature with an Arbuckle short. So that oh great a good double bill. I can't remember the date on the watch party. It's after the eleventh. Yeah. So it's probably like I'm dealing with the eleventh, and I'll deal with the other one. So yeah, that's it. Well, we'll look out for it. We'll look out for it, um, and hopefully we'll hopefully we'll see you again before the silence are out. Oh okay. We we haven't got long. You're getting close. Yeah, you're. Getting <laughs> We're getting close. very close. Yeah. I think there's about four left. Yeah, but uh, but no, it's been it's been fantastic. Thanks so much, Steve. We'll see you soon. All right. See you. Take care. <laughs> Well, that's just about it for episode 29. A great conversation with a great guest about a great film. If this podcast has inspired you to go back and rewatch That's My Wife, then please do get in touch and let me know what you made of it. I'd love to hear from you. 
You can post your thoughts on the Laurel and Hardy podcast Facebook page, in the Blogheads Facebook group, on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Or, or you could just send me a good old-fashioned email. Uh, the new email address is patrick at laurelandhardymag.com. That's patrick at laurelandhardymag.com. Uh, in fact, please feel free to get in touch just generally. You, know, you could tell me what you like or don't like about the show, or especially let me know your thoughts on the films that we're covering. Uh, I do especially like audio messages uh, in MP3 format, and if you can email one of these, who knows, you might even make it onto a future episode. Now the next episode, episode 30, is going to be big. Big by name, big by nature. Yes, you've guessed it, the next film in focus is going to be the one and only big business. Um, all being well, I'll be joined by both Randy Scretvet and Richard Band, so I'm really looking forward to that one. Now, before we go our merry ways, I just wanted to bring something to your attention. Uh, I've been asked a few times over the last few months whether there's any way that listeners and fans of the podcast can help to show their support for the show and help to keep it going. Well, previously, the answer has always been no. Um, however, that is all about to change. Um, I'm currently in the process of setting up a Patreon or Patreon page. Uh, now, if you've not heard of this before, Patreon is a platform where you can find your favourite podcasts and show your support by donating a few pounds or a few dollars or euros or whatever your currency uh, each month. Uh, it's a great way for you to practically show your appreciation for the podcasts uh, and uh, it will assist me greatly in keeping the wheels turning. Uh, in return for your support, you'll also receive a reward. Uh, now, this might include extra exclusive podcast episodes um, or just longer episodes in general um, available only to subscribers also uh, subscriptions to the laurel and hardy magazine it'll all depend on the level of support you choose and there'll be a menu of options for you uh, when the time comes uh, i will still be posting the normal podcasts in the normal places so don't worry about that nothing will change in that respect uh, but i will provide more details about that and how you can become a patron of the laurel and hardy podcast very soon so that's about all we have time for today. Uh, a huge thank you to today's guest, Steve Massa. Thank you, of course, to the uh, Bohunks Orchestra and to Basta Music for the wonderful tunes. And last but not least, thank you for sticking with me. And until next time, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And a very goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.